Okay, let's get started. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm glad that so many are still making it at the at the early hour. Uh, there's a, I can tell the remote students that there's a little bit of attrition on the Stockholm side, but but not a lot. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, agriculture and risk today, and we'll have two parts to the lecture. I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, the theory and the paper in the first part, and then we'll spend more time in the second half talking about the Carlin et al. paper that you read. Uh, so I want to start by tying what we're going to talk about today together with what we saw in the last few weeks, and in particular last week. So last week we talked about credit markets and we saw that investments in productive activities can be constrained by imperfect credit markets. So when there's moral hazard and adverse selection, uh, that makes it hard for companies to offer credit products to people. And microfinance tries to solve these problems by, in various ways, by having joint uh, liability among the borrowers. And to some extent, we saw that it succeeds in doing that. It's not perfect, um, but it is sort of a step in the right direction. Today, we'll talk about another constraint to productivity in low income settings, and that's risk. And so we'll start by seeing that people living in low income contexts do face a lot of risk. I'll show you some data that uh, suggests that. And similarly, as for credit, that suggests that people should want to buy insurance to insure against those risks and that, that there should be insurance companies that offer uh, insurance products to them. And we'll see under which condition this is under which conditions this is true. If you're risk averse, you should have a demand for insurance. Um, and that insurance should then be beneficial for you. And in fact, I'll show you some evidence that shows that indeed insurance does have positive effects. I'll show you some on, well, we'll talk about the Carlin paper, which shows positive effects on investment. I'll show you a little bit of evidence showing that insurance has positive effects on uh, subjective well being, even. But that then presents a puzzle because it suggests that people should want to buy insurance. And we find empirically that often people don't. The take up for insurance in low income countries is often extremely low. And we'll talk about why that might be the case. And I'll show you an experiment that provides a really neat and interesting answer to that question. So that answer will be that insurance premiums need to be paid up front. You need to pay for the insurance immediately, but the benefits don't arrive until later. And to get if you are a person who is liquidity constrained and or you are present biased, you prefer immediate outcomes relative to later outcomes that might give rise to a preference for not buying insurance, even though the insurance actually does good things for you. And then if you add to that, maybe imperfect trust in insurance companies that can compound the problem um, and make insurance policies unattractive. So that'll be the first part of the lecture. So let's start by talking about how much risk poor people face. So here's a figure from a paper by Sima Yaya Chandran from 2006, where she plots GDP against wage volatility in a number of countries. So GDP, log GDP is on the X axis and wage volatility is on the Y axis. Volatility, volatility just means how much do wages move around from month to month, from year to year. And you can see that there's a clear negative relationship here. So the, the richer a country is, the lower the wage volatility is. And over on the left, you have very poor countries with very high wage volatility. So MMR is Myanmar, uh, Zimbabwe, India, Bangladesh, all have relatively low GDP and high wage volatility. In contrast, on the right, you have countries with high GDP and low wage volatility, the US, New Zealand, Belgium, and so on. So can somebody think of an intuition why that might be? Why do we have such high wage volatility? Where does that come from in low income countries? Uh, because of informal job sector, they don't have formal uh, employment, rather they work on daily wages. Exactly, so there's a lot of casual wage employment. You stand by the side of the road in the morning with your chainsaw and you wait for someone to come and give you a job for the day. Exactly, and that's, some days you get lucky and someone comes and picks you up and gives you work for the day, but other, other days you don't. Yeah. Other reasons? You no, know, agriculture itself, I think it's yeah. something, uh, 
you know you 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 don't have you don't have you don't have the money all all the year it's just maybe for one season or two season it's it's a cycle it's a cycle thing exactly crop cycles right you you plant something many people in poor countries are farmers you plant something you wait for it to grow and then you harvest and after harvest you sell it and that's when you have money and then happens once a year maybe twice a year uh, in some cases less than once a year so that introduces a lot of variability in your income yeah. exactly so that's some of the sources of this wage volatility or income volatility um, at the same time there's a lot of price fluctuation, and that's true around the world, but especially in low-income settings. So here's an example graph from a 2010 paper that shows uh, the grain price development over time. And this is for the whole world, but it would look more extreme in uh, low-income countries. You can see quite a lot of movement, right? This is normalized to 2005, that's 100%. And so you can see movements up to 350% or so. So that's a lot of price volatility. Um, and if you combine that with that wage volatility that we just saw, you can see the problem. It's also interesting, of course, that this, uh, these prices are gonna go in the wrong direction relative to your wages, right? So when you have a lot of money after you've just harvested, that's also when prices are gonna be low because everybody's selling their crop at that time, right? Whereas in the lean season, when you're waiting for things to grow, um, that's also when prices are going to go up because the harvest has been sold and there's less around. And that's also when your wages, wages are low. So that compounds the problem. OK, so there's a lot of risk in low income settings. And that should mean that insurance should be quite attractive. And we'll see under which conditions this is true. So let me show you a little bit of theory. And we'll start with the same microentrepreneur that we talked about last week. Uh, remember that they have a project that requires one unit of capital, and that project pays a return R with a probability P when the project is successful, and otherwise it pays nothing. So the expected earnings are what P, P times R, and we saw that last week. And that's when they're not insured against anything. That's just the entrepreneur doing their thing without any insurance. So let's say, for example, that this person is a farmer, then one minus P could be the probability that there's a bad weather event, that there's a drought, for example, that destroys their crop. And we'll say it destroys their crop entirely. So now think about offering this person an actuarially fair insurance product that compensates them entirely when they lose their harvest. What does actuarially fair mean? It means that the cost of the insurance premium is exactly equal to the expected cost of the claim. So the insurance company makes no profit. It's a competitive market. They just charge you the premium that corresponds to what they expect to have to pay out to you on average over many years or over many uh, insurance takers uh, in terms of payouts because your crop fails. So what's the expected cost of a claim like that? Well, the claim happens in bad years or in, in a bad event, that's one minus P. And what do, does the insurance company have to pay in that case? It has to pay R, right? The harvest is lost entirely in the drought. And so the insurance company needs to compensate the person entirely for that lost harvest. And importantly, the insurance taker needs to pay that cost regardless of whether or not there's a a drought or not, right? They just pay the premium up front, and then the insurance company just keeps the premium in the case of the uh, the good outcome, and in the bad outcome, they pay the uh, the return R that the farmer lost. Okay, so what are the what's the payoffs to the farmer in case everything goes well? So in the good state of the world, probability P, the farmer earns the return R and they pay the cost of the insurance C. So their income is R minus C, and we know what C is, it's just one minus P times R. So substitute that in, and then that gives you P times R. Right? So R minus C, just substitute for the C and you have P times R. That's the expected income of the farmer when they have insurance in the good state of the world. Notice that that's the same as the expected income without insurance. 
what happens in the bad state of the world? So if there's a drought, they don't earn their R, they still have to pay the C, still need to pay the insurance, but now they get compensated for the R that they lost from the insurance company. By how much? By exactly that R. The company just gives them back that R that they lost. So again, their income is R minus C. So they're paying the cost and the R is now no longer their own harvest. It's what the insurance company compensates them for the harvest that they lost in the drought. And again, because the insurance is actuarially fair, we can substitute for the C. So this again, yields earnings that are P times R. So at this point, you should notice that this is again, the same income that they had without insurance and that they had with insurance in the good state of the world. So the incomes are the same in all three cases. With and without insurance, the farmer can expect to earn PR. Why would anybody want insurance in that case? Often insurance won't be exactly actuarially fair. The insurance company needs a little bit of money on top of the premium for admin costs and so on. Even less somebody should want to buy insurance in a case like that. The answer is that when you're risk averse, you like insurance. And so we'll see now why that's the case. So last week we had said that our farmer is risk neutral. And that was a fine assumption to make at the time but it's not an accurate assumption. Most people are risk averse. There's a lot of behavioral economics results that show that people are indeed risk averse. And so we'll adopt this assumption now and that's a little bit more realistic and describes the world better. As a brief side note, why didn't we already do that last week? Why did we think about a risk neutral farmer last week? The answer is that for credit, we were mainly interested in supply side. We were interested in why companies might not want to offer credit products moral hazard, adverse selection, and so on. For, and so there, the farmer's characteristics don't matter all that much. For insurance, demand is a big part of the story. It, the, the fact that insurance demand is low is the big puzzle that we want to explain, or one of the big puzzles. And so for that, we need to understand the preferences that dictate whether or not the person buys insurance. And so risk aversion is a better assumption to make. So, Let's assume risk aversion now and think about what the farmer's utility is with and without insurance. So without insurance, their utility is U times R. So that's their return they get from their project. That's now no longer just R, but it's U of R. Sorry, I said times, I think. U of R times the probability of the good outcome plus one minus P times the probability of the bad outcome. The, you, the one minus P times the utility of the bad outcome. So that's just P times U of R. With insurance, this is the farmer's utility. So it's the probability of the good outcome times the utility of R minus C. So that's the return that they earn minus the cost of the insurance, plus the probability of the bad outcome times that same utility. Remember in the insurance case, uh, they get compensated if they lose their harvest and so their income is the same, they're still paying the insurance cost. And so that's just U of R minus C, that P times P plus one minus P, that's just one. And because we can again substitute for the C, everything's actuarially fair, that's the U of P times, the utility of P times R. So notice that these are slightly different here at the top, we have P times the utility of R. At the bottom, we have the utility of P times R. And we'll show now that these are different when there's risk aversion. Notice first that if the utility function is linear, so if U of X is just X, then these two utilities are the same and the person is indifferent between having insurance and not having insurance. Right? Just omit the U's here you have P times R and P times R. That's what we saw on the previous couple of slides. That's the outcome, the income with and without insurance is always P times R. So they're risk neutral in that case. But when the utility function is concave, the person prefers the insurance. And so here's the reason why that's true. Concavity is defined, is characterized by the fact that the utility of a convex combination of outcomes 
this is a convex combination. I'm taking a little bit of y1 and a little bit of y2, sort of moving somewhere in between y1 and y2, is larger than the convex combination of those two utilities, of the two individual utilities. Right? So I'm taking the utility of y1 and the utility of y2, and I'm computing a convex combination of the two. I'm taking p of y1 and 1 minus p of y2. So that's the definition of concavity. So just adapt this to our setting. We'll replace the y1 with r and the y2 with 0. And that gives us u of pr plus 0 is greater than p of ur. So that's just replacing here with zeros. And so that tells you u of pr is greater than p of ur. So where have we seen that before? U of PR, that's the utility with insurance. And P times U, R, U of R, that's the utility without insurance. And if the function is concave, this utility with insurance is greater than the utility without insurance. So that's how concavity in the utility function gives you a preference for having insurance when it's actuarially fair. So utility with the insurance is larger than utility without insurance, even though the expected earnings are PR in both cases. But because you're risk averse and without insurance, you face more risk, you prefer uh, the insurance. Hi, everyone. So I'm now going to interrupt the lecture video and provide you what's hopefully a better explanation uh, for the reason why utility with insurance is higher than utility without insurance graphically than what I gave in the lecture. So I'm drawing on this graph income on the x-axis and utility on the y-axis. And on the right over here, we have R, which is the return in the good state of the world. And over here, we have zero, which is the return in the bad state of the world. And in the middle, we have PR, which is the expected return without insurance and it's the certain return with insurance. So we can now ask, where does utility lie with and without insurance? I've drawn the utility function in red here. The fact that it's bent like this tells you that it's a concave function. And we can read off the utility of the certain outcome PR in the case of insurance by simply going up from PR and looking at the value of that function at that point on the x-axis. And that's u of pr, the utility at the point pr. To figure out what utility without insurance is, we can proceed as follows. Remember that we showed on the previous slide that utility without insurance is p times u of r. And I'm now going to show you that that y-coordinate corresponds to exactly the height of a straight line at the point pr that connects the origin to this point up here with the x-coordinate r and the y-coordinate u of r. So to see that that point lies exactly in this place, let's look at the, the equation that defines this line. Let's figure out the slope of that line first. That line goes up u of r over a distance from 0 to r. So the slope is u of r divided by r. The line goes through the origin, so we don't have a constant to add. So the line's equation is simply u of r divided by r times y. Now, what's the value of that function at the point pr? Replace the y with pr. Then you have u of r divided by r times pr. The r's cancel, and so you're left with p times u of r. And that's precisely the expected utility in the world without insurance. So what that means is that the expected utility with insurance is up here. The expected utility without insurance is down here. It's below the expected utility with insurance. And the reason for that is that this is a concave function that's always going to lie above this straight line. So that's the graphical intuition for why utility is higher with insurance than without insurance. All right, so 
that means that a risk averse person should want to buy insurance. So that's the second fact. The first fact is the poor face a lot of risk. risk. The second fact is if you're risk averse, which many people are, you should want to buy actuarially fair insurance when it's available. The third fact is that insurance actually does have benefits for people. And I want to just mention briefly two examples. And briefly, because we'll talk about the first one of them in greater detail in the second half. So you read the Carlin et al. paper in the QJE from 2014 that shows that with crop insurance, people increase their agriculture investment. So clearly that insurance does good things for them that allows them to have higher income. And then uh, I did a, a study a couple of years ago in Nairobi where we give people health insurance. These are informal sector workers and we give them health insurance for a year. And we find that that doesn't have a lot of economic effects but it makes them less stressed. So it, in, it reduces self-reported levels of stress. They're more likely to say that they feel relaxed and it also reduces the level of stress hormones. So cortisol levels are lower when people have insurance. So here's the table from the paper that shows that effect on cortisol. So the left column shows you the effects of the insurance on cortisol levels. It's a negative effect. And the second column is a, a cash transfer that's equally large as the insurance. And you can see that that has lower effects on stress levels than the insurance. So there's something useful here happening with the insurance, people are less stressed um, than even with a cash transfer of, of equal value. Did you have a question? Sorry, add more of a... Yes, so sorry, I, I was careless here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a difference between crop and rainfall insurance and that, yes, uh, I, should, I should be more careful. Yeah, so rainfall insurance is the right term. Okay. So that's the third fact. Insurance does good things for people. At the same time, take up is often low. And so there's a couple of example papers that I'm listing here that study the take up of insurance products in various settings, and they all find take up of less than 5%. That's really low. The Carlin paper that you read has some of the highest take ups, like their take up is you know, around 20, 30% or something like that. But in many studies take up is very low. Why is that the case? So an interesting possibility that I've already mentioned is that the premium has to be paid now but the benefits don't arrive until later. You have to pay for the insurance immediately, but then the payout doesn't come until later if it comes at all. And so how would we test experimentally if this matters? So I wanna introduce you to a really nice paper by Lorenzo Casaburi and Jack Willis. Lorenzo is an economist in Zurich and Jack at Columbia. Um, incidentally, Lorenzo worked on this project at the same time as I worked on that insurance project in Nairobi that I just told you about. And we were sitting at the same kitchen table in Nairobi because we shared an apartment for a while. Uh, so they work with a large sugar factory in Western Kenya and the smallholder farmers that deliver sugar cane to these farmers. Uh, it's the largest sugar company in East Africa. It was founded in 1971. And they work with about 80,000 farmers that grow sugar cane for this company under contract. And we'll see in a second how these contracts look. Sugarcane is super important in this setting. It's the main cash crop in the region, and it's an important source of income for a lot of these farmers. So for about a fourth of farmers, it's 80%, it's more than 80% of income. And for half of the farmers, it's at least 38% of income. So it's a really important uh, source of livelihoods, and it has a long crop cycle. So it takes about 16 months for it to be ready for harvest, and so that means each harvest is very important. If you lose the harvest, that's a big problem because it only comes so rarely. Okay, so here's what the contracts look like that this company works with. Uh, they stipulate that the farmers must sell to the company and the company must buy from them. So this is a fairly deep relationship. The company also harvests the crop for the farmer and they pay the farmer by the weight. And the contract covers at least three crop cycles. So that's at least four years. So again, very deep uh, working relationship. 
And in addition, there's something that Lorenzo and Jack call interlinking. And that means that um, there's credit interlinked with the contract. And that's a common feature of contract farming. So in practice, that means that the company provides the input to the farmer. So for example, fertilizer upfront, and then it just subtracts the cost of that from the harvest later. And this is the opening for the cool test that Lorenzo and Jack do. The fact that the harvest comes to the company because the company harvested them themselves and they can subtract this cost of fertilizer, that also means that they can just subtract the cost of an insurance premium, right? And so the core idea of the study is that the same mechanism of delayed payment that the company is really pretty sure about, they know that because they have such a deep relationship, this payment is gonna happen. Uh, that allows them to charge the farmers for the insurance product at a later point in time, not immediately upfront. So here's the study that they run. They work with 605 farmers and they're offered crop insurance. That's partly an index insurance. So it's, uh, it pays when the yield of the field is lower than predicted by a number of variables like crop size and location. Uh, notice that this is not a, a perfect uh, crop insurance. It still depends a little bit on effort, but the basic idea, uh, sorry, uh, index insurance, the basic idea, like you said just now is that index insurance removes the moral hazard problem. So you don't have to worry as much about effort when it's based on observable features like rainfall in many cases or here some other variables. So the index insurance here is offered at actuarially fair prices or with a 30% discount. And the actuarially fair premium is on average about $18. And that corresponds to about 3% of revenue. And if it pays out, if the insurance pays out, it covers 20% of expected revenue. So it's not, it's not full insurance, it's just partial insurance. And there's three treatment groups. The first treatment group gets offered insurance at the, at the actuarially fair price, and that has to be paid now. The second group gets offered insurance with a 30% discount, and that also has to be paid now. And the third group, that's the crucial group, they get offered insurance at the actuarially fair price, like the first group, but in contrast to the first group, they can pay it at harvest time. So they can wait with the payment until much, much later. So the question is, what is take up under these three conditions? And in particular, when the farmers are allowed to delay payment. So here's the take up rate when in the first condition when they have to pay the full amount and they have to pay immediately it's five percent so that's in line with the studies that i cited earlier it's very low people don't want this insurance here's what happens with the 30 percent discount if liquidity constraints are a big issue you might expect it to go up a lot it doesn't go up all that much it goes up one percentage point six percent Here's what happens with the pay at harvest treatment. It goes up to 72%. So that's a treatment effect that's probably as big as you'll ever see in papers in this literature. It's really massive. Suddenly 72% of farmers want this insurance product. So that's a big success. That suggests that this, uh, this difference between paying now and later is really important. So let's think about why that difference exists. And there's two candidate mechanisms that I wanna talk about that ex might explain this increase in demand when you allow farmers to pay late. Yeah. Do you then also see the higher default rates? Maybe? Say that again, sorry? Higher default rates. Higher the full, I don't understand, sorry. Default rates of payment that uh, the people who uh, need to pay for insurance uh, don't pay because uh, they have had a bad harvest. Ah, right, but that's precisely the, the situation when the insurance covers them, right? So the, pay, the payout of the insurance is the same as paying the premium, yeah. Yeah, good question. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so paying at harvest time means that they pay when they harvest and they insure the next 
No, it's immediate. It's that very same harvest that's in short. Uh, and are they mandatory for them? Yes. The, yeah, yeah, exactly. And then refuse to pay. No, exactly. That's precisely why I spend so much time waxing lyrical about the fact that there's such a close relationship here uh, that reassures the company that the farmer actually will pay because they've known them for a long time. And in fact, the company actually harvests for them so they can just harvest and then keep what they what they deserve uh, for the premium payment. Yeah. Any other questions? I have a question. Go ahead. Yeah. So if we take out the same analogy on normal insurances, then why would insurance company offer such a thing? Wouldn't it make their liquidity constraints? Right. Can somebody give a, an answer to that question? Why doesn't why don't insurance companies offer this? Why doesn't every insurance company do this? I think because there is different in har different harvest times. I mean, like uh, not all the uh, agriculture products are I don't know produced in 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 one season, for example. And uh, the I don't I don't know much about insurance, but the main thing behind it is, uh, for example, ten people sign up for insurance, and uh, luckily three or four of them uh, actually face disaster, and the insurance companies should have the money then to pay them. So if uh, uh, I don't know. I think the problem is there that uh, the harvest, the harvesting seasons is, are different. I don't okay, know. I'm I not think. Sure. Yeah, I think you're thinking about risks, risk sharing. Like the company, the insurance company is basically a risk sharing mechanism, and that's true. But there are many insurance companies out there that have enough clients so that that you know would allow them to uh, to smooth risk like that. Why doesn't every insurance company do this? You can pay later. Yeah. Yeah, so companies are generally not thought to discount the future beyond just interest rates. Uh, it's an interesting question whether, you know, because they're run by people, they do, but it's generally not the view that that, that happens. Professor, uh, maybe they they work through law of large numbers, but if they are not taking payments from upfront, then they won't be able to invest it and earn to pay out the money. Like my, my initial question was, why would they do it? Not why should, why are they not doing it? But why would they do it? If they oh, do it- Why would they do it? Oh, because like there's a lot more money to be made, right? Like you can increase take up from 5% to 72%. But if no one is paying upfront, then they don't have incoming cash flow. Yeah, but you know, do you think that you earn enough interest in the 16 months to to make up for a, a revenue loss from 72% down to 5% of take up? Probably not. It's mm -hmm. a good point. Like the insurance company doesn't have the premiums to earn a return on in those intervening 16 months, but that's a small sum compared to how much extra they can earn by increasing take up from 5% to 72%, right? I think the answer is precisely what we talked about in, in, in terms of the strong relationship. Like if any other insurance company does this that doesn't have an equally strong relationship and doesn't have a, as good a handle on people's income as this company does, then people just don't pay, right? So here, the fact that the insurance company or the sugar company harvests the crop for farmers and they can just keep what they deserve, that's a really important feature of this contract. Um, and in many other settings, that's not the case. There's uh, a serious uh, moral hazard concern for the company in terms of non-payment. Okay, so let's think about two mechanisms. Uh, the first one is liquidity constraints. So it might be that people just don't have the money to pay up front, and it's only at the time of the harvest that they have enough money to pay for the product. And they want the product all along, but at the time that they're being offered it normally, they just can't afford it. Second possibility is time preferences or present bias. So people may just dislike having to pay the premium immediately when the benefits only materialize later. So let's think through these two possible explanations. Um, and I'll show you two pieces of evidence 
to suggest that liquidity constraints play a partial role. And then one piece of evidence to suggest that present bias also matters. So here's the first piece of evidence for liquidity constraints. And it is that the increase in the take up under this delayed payment condition is smaller among farmers with high income and it's larger among poor farmers. So here's a table from Jax and Lorenzo's paper that where the dependent variable is take up of the insurance. And you can see down here the treatment effect of the pay at harvest condition. So that's a very large positive number. If you allow them to pay at harvest day, um, they take up a lot more. And then at the top, you can see various measures of the wealth and the income of farmers. And Jack and Lorenzo then interact put this variable in the regression. So this X here is the corresponding variable at the column head. And they put that variable in the regression and then they interacted with the treatment condition paying at harvest. So what does this what do these coefficients that are in the red box measure? They measure the differential treatment effect among the people who have a very high X. So this number, for example, is saying that the increase in insurance take up that you get from paying late is smaller among people who cultivate a lot of land. The increase in insurance take up in the treatment condition is smaller among the people who cultivate a lot of land. In other words, the effect is smaller among the rich people the effect is larger among the poor people. Yeah, so the poor people have a higher treatment effect on take up. Their take up changes more when you offer them to pay late. Similarly for owning cows, how much yield they had in prior years and so on. The treatment effect is largest for poor people. And that suggests, why is the treatment effect largest for poor people? That suggests that probably because they're poor, because they're constrained in their liquidity, they can't afford to pay the insurance. And when you offer them the late payment option, they're sort of released from that. And that's why they have a really large treatment effect. Any questions about this? Okay, so that's just suggestive evidence, right? There are many differences between low income and high income people. And it doesn't necessarily have to be liquidity constraints. It could just be that they have different preferences. Uh, they respond differently to treatment for other reasons. So here's a closer test, a more careful test of this liquidity constraint story. They do what's called a mechanism experiment. So it's a small experiment that's added onto the main experiment to elucidate whether this liquidity constraint channel plays a role. They provide farmers with money to buy the insurance, either immediately or at harvest. And so if take up increases under that condition, that suggests that liquidity constraints were important. So here are the results of that treatment. It's with 120 farmers, and there's now four conditions. There's again the basic condition of paying, having to pay up front. But then they add a condition where you also have to pay up front, except you also get the money in order to do that. And they compensate you for that payment. So you can, it's basically free for you or cheaper for you to buy the insurance. And lo and behold, take up does increase in that case. So that suggests that people were liquidity constrained. Yeah, they didn't part, these people who buy it with the extra money that they've gotten, they probably would have liked to buy it earlier, but they didn't have the money to do it. And so once you give them the money, they buy it. So that's a role for liquidity constraints and you get a similar bump when you give that money later, but it's somewhat smaller. Yeah, so the fact that take up increases when you give people money to pay for the insurance product, that suggests that liquidity constraints are part of the reason why take up is low under the regular payment scheme. But it doesn't completely remove the treatment effect of the late payment, right? The two bars on the left are still lower than the two bars on the right. So liquidity constraints can't be the entire answer, because if that were the case, then you would find that the take up, even with the upfront payment, goes to what you get with the delayed payment right away. 
Any questions about this? Okay, so that suggests that liquidity constraints are part of the story. Now let's talk about present bias. So let me tell you why present bias reduces uh, demand for insurance. So let's add a present bias parameter to all delayed outcomes in our initial setup. <laughs> We've basically forgotten to do this earlier. Uh, in this little model that we wrote down, we didn't take account of the fact that payouts happen later and other and costs happen sooner. So if you allow for that, then the utility without insurance becomes this expression. It's the probability of the good outcome times this present bias parameter beta. That's a constant that's smaller than one. So you're making it smaller times the utility of your returns. And that's because that return happens in the future. You're discounting it. Plus the bad state of the world probability times beta times the utility of nothing. So that's just P beta times utility of your return. What does it look like with insurance? So here's the crucial difference. With insurance, the par farmer pays the premium C immediately, but their return R only arrives at harvest time. So the C is felt fully without discounting, without multiplying with that beta, uh, but the return has to be multiplied with the beta because it only shows up later, right? Uh, and this is the same is true in the case of drought. They don't get the insurance payout until harvest time. They pay the cost immediately, but the payout doesn't arrive until harvest time. Uh, and, and of course, the insurance company doesn't pay interest on the, on the payment that they make to the farmer. They just pay the R, right? And so the farmer's utility with, in, uh, with insurance is the negative utility of having to pay the premium up front plus the discounted utility of receiving the return or the insurance payment in the bad case of the world. So that's just u of minus c plus beta times u of r. So we've now pulled apart this R minus C that we had in the parentheses earlier, and we've allowed for the fact that the R arrives later and therefore has to be discounted. Does that make sense? Okay, so now let's ask whether this utility with insurance can ever be smaller than the utility without insurance. So that would mean that this expression here is smaller than this expression. So that's what I've written down here. And we just rearrange that a little bit to bring all of the beta UR terms on the left-hand side and the U of minus C terms on the right-hand side. So notice that both the left-hand side and the right-hand side are positive. So the U of minus C is negative, but then when you multiply it with a minus one, it becomes positive. And the left-hand side is also positive. And that beta only shows up on the left-hand side. So there's positive number here and a beta, there's a positive number here. And that means that if you make the beta small enough, you can always force this left-hand side to be smaller than the right-hand side. And with two positive numbers, you can choose any value of beta that you like. as close to zero as you want to go. You can always force that left-hand side to be smaller than the right-hand side. And what that means is that in that case, even a risk-averse farmer doesn't buy insurance. And so the utility of the insurance is now lower than the utility of not having insurance. And that's because the farmer dislikes, when the beta is very low, the farmer really dislikes having to make that payment upfront when the return of the insurance only comes later. Does that make sense? So that's what we omitted from our model earlier. Uh, and when you add it in, you can see how it might limit demand for insurance. If present bias is strong enough, people don't wanna buy insurance. Okay, so how do Jack and Lorenzo test for the importance of present bias? Here's the test that they run. There's another mechanism experiment with 120 farmers who choose between receiving insurance on the one hand or receiving the value of the premium in cash. And there's two groups here. The first group makes that choice immediately and they receive the chosen outcome immediately, either the cash or the insurance. The second group 
also makes a choice immediately, but they don't receive their chosen outcome until one month into the future. And so to see that this identifies the role of present bias, we need to be a little technical. Um, so first note that in both groups, people are making an intertemporal choice between a sooner and a later outcome. So they're choosing between money and insurance. Money is available as soon as it's paid out to you. So that's a sooner benefit. Insurance, the benefits only arrive later. So that's an intertemporal choice. And present bias is a technical term that refers to a greater preference for the sooner outcome compared to the later outcome when that sooner outcome happens immediately. So in this case, present bias implies that when you're choosing between cash and insurance, you'll be more likely to prefer cash over insurance when that cash is available immediately. So for group one, when they're choosing between cash and insurance, the cash is available immediately. They're getting their outcome right away. For group two, the cash is only available much from now and the insurance is also delayed. So present bias says that in the first of these cases, when the cash is available immediately, when the sooner outcome is available immediately, they'll be more likely to prefer the cash. Another way of saying this is that there's something special about the present. The present gets extra value. That's why it's called present bias. You're biased towards the present. And put in the context, in terms of our experiment, with present bias, the demand for the insurance should be lower when the alternative, namely money, is available immediately. So maybe let me briefly illustrate this. So here's time. And here is now. Let's say you're choosing between a Y1 that happens immediately and a Y2 that happens somewhat later. Y1 is the cash, Y2 is the insurance. And either that Y1 is available immediately or you're making the same choice between Y1 and Y2, but they're both delayed into the future. So the temporal distance between them is the same. It's just that in one case, the Y1 is available immediately and in the other case, it's available sooner. Present bias says that you're, in this case, on the left, you will strongly prefer Y1 to Y2. When they're both delayed into the future, you're less likely to prefer Y1 to Y2. You might still do, but you're less likely to. Yeah. So they don't have to be, they could be. Uh, and I think that's maybe a good way to think about it. So assume that they're, that they're equally large. You like to get it sooner rather than later. Maybe what we would get if they're equally large, we would get a strong preference for Y1 over Y2 uh, when Y12 is a, Y, Y1 is available immediately, we'd still get a presence, but maybe somewhat less strong when they're both in the future. Yeah. Right? So this is basically saying, if I give you a choice between $10 today and $10 tomorrow, you really want $10 today. If I give you a choice between $10 a year from now and $10 a year and a day from now, you don't care that much. Right, exactly. So, so that's it, their preferences, right? And we don't argue about them. So it could be that the person prefers $12 or it could be that they prefer $10. I think your, your example with equal amounts is actually a good one. Um, like think about the, the example that I just gave, $10 today versus $10 tomorrow. Most people would say, no, no, come on, give me $10 today. $10 a year from now versus $10 a year and a day from now. I don't know, do you care? I don't care much. So that's present bias, right? You really, there's, a, there's an extra value attached to getting something today. Okay. Um, okay, so what that implies is that the demand for insurance should be lower when the money is available immediately, the alternative to the insurance. And so that's exactly what Jack and Lorenzo find. The left column shows you 
the insurance take up when the money is available immediately, when both the insurance and the money materialize immediately after the choice, the right column shows you the insurance take up when uh, both money and insurance are delayed by a month. So that's uh, that. Sorry, was there a question? Yeah, um, going back to the, the ten dollars today versus ten dollars tomorrow. Yeah. What if the, the um, we change the amount? Does it affect the preference? Like, okay, ten dollars today versus like hundred dollars tomorrow. Does it change? Does right. it change it? So it, it, it will. It likely affect the choice, right? In most people, uh, the choice will change based on the underlying preference. Like there people generally assume that there's an underlying preference that dictates how you choose in these settings. And there is gonna be an amount where you're indifferent and below that amount, you prefer uh, the immediate outcome and above that amount, you prefer the delayed outcome. Okay. So yeah, the, the way that these preferences typically get elicited is by, people showing, is by showing people a series of choices between a small amount available immediately and a large amount of available later. Any other questions? Okay, so what we've seen then is that because with present bias, the demand for insurance should be lower when the money is available immediately. And that's actually what we find that suggests that there is a role of present bias here. So the farmers are present biased, they would really like to have the money now, and that limits their demand for insurance. So they're not flip that around and say, if farmers have to pay for the insurance immediately, that payment hurts. It hurts more when it happens immediately than it, when it happens later. And that limits their demand for insurance. Okay, so let me sum up what I've told you. So we've seen that the poor face a lot of risk, um, that when you're risk averse and you get an actuarially fair insurance offer to you, you should like to take up that insurance and we've seen that there's some evidence to suggest that insurance actually has positive effects on investment and well-being, but in practice, insurance take-up is very low. And the study by Jack and Lorenzo that I showed you suggests that one reason for that is that the premium payment in most cases is immediate, but the benefits are only delayed. And if you put that together with uh, liquidity constraints and present bias, it would lead to low demand for insurance and if you add to that low trust in insurance companies you're not fully sure they're going to pay up later on that's a problem we haven't even talked about yet it doesn't matter much in lorenzo's and jack's paper but it has shown been shown to matter in other settings then you have a problem of, of low take up so let me stop here uh, we'll take a quick break and then after the break we'll talk about uh, dean carlin and colleagues paper to answer give a more detailed answer to this question is it actually the case that uh, insurance has positive effects on investment. Okay, so let's come back uh, on the hour, which is uh, three minutes from now. Sorry, this is slightly shorter. Okay, so let's get going again. Sorry, this was a slightly shorter break. Um, so I'm hoping that we have Robert Osei with us. Uh, Robert, are you here? Yes, I am. Great, uh, welcome. So, um, Continuing our series of uh, star appearances, uh, we now have one of the co-authors of the paper that you read, the Carlin et al. Uh, QJE paper from 2014. Uh, it's Professor uh, Robert Darko Osei from the University of Ghana, who is one of the authors of this paper. Um, and he's very kindly agreed to speak to us today at a very early hour for him. Uh, Robert, what time it is? is it where you are now? 7 a.m. Okay, great. Thank you so much for getting up so early for us. We greatly appreciate it. So uh, Professor Ose is a professor at the University of Ghana, like I say, in economics. He's also the vice dean there, uh, which is an administrative position that carries a lot of work. And so we're especially grateful uh, that you made time for us this morning. And so Robert, the students have all read your paper. Uh, they've all come prepared with questions about the paper, and so we're very much looking forward to your uh, presentation and to being able to ask those questions. Um, so we have until we have one hour, and it's up to you 
uh, how to how to do it if you want to ask answer questions throughout or or at the end. So um, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Okay, so um, thank you very much, Johan. Um, I believe that uh, uh, you have all read this, so this is not supposed to um, go too much into details in the paper. It's just to introduce it so that we can have a discussion around some of the issues that uh, the paper tries to address. Um, so, um, I think that it's uh, one fact that is established and still remains quite problematic today in sub-Saharan Africa relates to um, agriculture investments. Of course, we know that agriculture is dominated by smallholder farmers and uh, typically within the sector, um, investments are generally very, very low uh, relative to other parts of the world. So if you take irrigated land, for instance, um, even within the sub-Saharan Africa region, um, Ghana is, seems to be very, very low. And already the sub-Saharan Africa um, levels are much, much lower than say what pertains in South Asia. Okay, if you take fertilizer consumption as well, a uh, similar story. Um, again, uh, the fertilizer use per um, acre of land or hectare of land is very low. Um, again, even um, for the sub-Saharan Africa uh, sub-region, um, Ghana is very low compared to other places in the sub-region. Um, you take a brick machinery, same story. Um, and the low investments translate to um, low yields, unsurprisingly. And so again, um, if you just take uh, the cereal yields, um, when Ghana is just a little over one, uh, one ton, 1.2 tons per hectare, um, other places, are doing close to three tons. So again, you invest low, you get, of course, low returns. Okay, and of course that translates into significant yield gaps um, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also um, in Ghana um, for sure. Now, of course, um, and as I indicated earlier, um, the investments in agriculture is low, and we know that agriculture is dominated by smallholder farmers with relatively um, low average size farms, um, two hectares, 2.5 hectares uh, per, per plot. Now, if you ask the farmers why, um, they, they do not invest more. For instance, in the improved seeds and then in fertilizer. Um, the typical answer, I mean, and again, th this comes up over and over again. Uh, the typical answer is that, of course, I do not have money, right? Uh, but of course, if you have a discussion with farmers and you probe further, I think one other issue that comes up has to do with the risk. And the typical response then is that um, the hybrids do not do too well. Um, and also um, the hybrids tend to be quite temperamental um, in terms of how farmers need to deal with it. Uh, in another um, uh, experiment that we did, um, for instance, uh, which, uh, and it was to do with farmer training, and um, the response was generally very low. And when we interrogated uh, farmers through qualitative studies, um, what we found was that farmers had actually 
um, acted as if they were using the old seeds or the seeds that they would typically uh, use as opposed to the hybrid seeds. However, the hybrid seeds required that harvesting was done about two weeks earlier um, than the uh, usual seeds that the farmers used. And so what we then found was that there was significant amount of um, um, post-harvest and harvest losses. Uh, um, and so again, ultimately um, the results was that um, the program didn't gain much in terms of improvements in um, outcomes. And what this also meant was that farmers didn't want to continue investing in um, their farms and so had to revert back to uh, doing things the old way. So interrogation and then interaction with farmers will suggest that um, there is risks associated with um, the farming activity as a whole and therefore uh, investing in um, things that could improve the yields becomes quite problematic. So these two constraints, the capital constraint and then the uh, constraint associated with the risks, and the fact that farmers are risk averse, means that, um, or typically, theoretically, can explain why uh, investment in agriculture is slow. So, of course, if you have these two problems of uh, risk aversion and then um, capital uh, constraints, possible ways of getting around them is through insurance, okay, and also um, by easing the capital constraints. And this essentially then formed the basis of this paper uh, that uh, we did. Uh, the question of uh, why rainfall insurance, um, of course, it's an alternative to the uh, crop insurance and uh, it removes some of the relevant risks. Um, and also we uh, knew from the literature that the crop insurance are generally um, failed. Okay, of course, um, there was issue of uh, adverse selection, uh, issue moral hazard um, issues as well associated with the um, crop insurance. And generally the crop insurance uh, tend to have quite high administrative costs uh, because you need to monitor the actual crop losses and then make a payment in lieu of the um, reported quote unquote uh, crop losses, okay? So this uh, product that we used as the basis of the study was a rainfall insurance um, and essentially was to provide a payout when farmers experienced um, severe drought or indeed excess uh, rain. And again, the whole essence of the rainfall insurance, if you remember the slide on the constraints, was to ease that potential um, risk constraint associated with investing in the farms. Okay, but I think importantly as well, and in relation to this particular study, the rainfall insurance was designed with maize in mind. And so in terms of the um, drought period, as well as the excess rain, um, they were essentially uh, simulated with uh, maize in mind. So, Again, what this paper does is very simple. Um, try to manipulate um, the availability of capital and insurance, and indeed observe the responses. And based on that, you are able to then tell whether 
it is credit that is a binding constraint or indeed it is um, risks that is the binding constraint. Um, of course, if credit is binding constraint, we will invest less, okay? Um, and if we invest less in the inputs, again, it has implications for whatever output you get. If you have uh, insurance being imperfect, um, then you find that investments output may increase a little even when the capital um, drop. And so um, you can provide all the credit, relax the credit constraint, but because insurance is the binding constraint, uh, farmers will not respond to the credit incentive, even in the presence of the um, insurance. So this is the uh, essentially uh, the thinking behind the experiment that um, we did. So in terms of the empirical design, um, we had uh, essentially, well, you can think of three treatment arms and a control. Um, one treatment arm, of course, had to do with the pure credits. So you give farmers just credits. The other was just um, rainfall insurance. And the third was a combination of both insurance as well as the um, grants. Um, but also what we did was to um, the, randomize the price of the insurance so that we could actually derive uh, the demand for insurance associated with um, maize or associated with this particular insurance product for maize and for this uh, group of smallholder farmers. Um, for the credit constraint, um, we provided support that enabled farmers purchase inputs as recommended by the Ministry of um, Agriculture. And that meant that it was about uh, 60 Ghana cities. Um, in today's money, 60 Ghana cities is just about $10 per acre. Um, for a maximum of 10 acres. Okay, in terms of the uh, rainfall uh, insurance, um, of course, we were dealing with smallholder farmers, so it was important that um, the insurance product was simple, but also critically, it was transparent, so they could understand it. But over time, they believed that they would actually get a pay off in the uh, in the instance where the um, insurance is triggered. And of course, what it also meant with the rainfall insurance is that uh, you do sacrifice basis risk uh, because of course, um, it's going to be the rainfall within a given area and you could not get the actual rainfall pattern at a micro level. Uh, now, probably um, with the improvements in satellite imagery, uh, and the link between the satellite imagery and then projections associated with rainfall, probably we could significantly improve uh, the insurance product. But of course, um, in this particular case, I think it's important to mention that um, we could, we did sacrifice a little bit uh, basis risks because again, you, we were basing the triggers on um, the average rainfall that the metro uh, unit was supplying to uh, generally um, farmers in the area. Now the insurance was provided for free in the first year, uh, up to 15 acres, and uh, the um, actual value was um, about 
between eight and nine cities per acre. Again, in today's money, uh, eight to nine Ghana cities is um, a little, th this, again, this experiment was done in 2011. So at the time, I think it was, uh, the dollar was about uh, 1.5 for thereabouts uh, Ghana cities to the dollar. So this would translate to just about six or so dollars per acre. So what we then, after providing the credits and the uh, insurance, um, of course, we, we did collect data from the beginning of the sample, and then we collected data also at the end of the sample. I need to also mention that for the farmers, we drew the farmer list from an earlier survey we had done in this particular part of Ghana in 2007, uh, which was quite an extensive uh, survey. And fortunately for us, the survey that had been done was done with the aim of assessing um, generally agriculture production and improvements in this part of the country. So it was um, essentially a good basis for learning about which type of farmers we wanted to use um, for the survey, uh, for the experiments. Um, and even at that time um, in Ghana cities, um, uh, these were some of the numbers that um, the farmers were generally uh, making a loss, um, driven in large part from um, the, not just the costs, uh, the total cost was driven largely by the labor inputs. Um, and compared to the harvest values, uh, the farmers were making a significant loss. And um, generally about 30% of the cost of uh, production. Um, the rainfall measure, the prospective payout per hectare was five. Um, according to the insurance uh, policy, um, again, insurance payout was uh, just about um, uh, 30 for these uh, farmers. And largely the areas caught, acres cultivated was about um, 14 or so for uh, the households. Now, okay, let me also mention that this is the northern part of Ghana where population density is generally very low. And so typically, um, and it's semi-arid, um, and so this part of Ghana will typically also have um, households on average having a relatively larger uh, farm sizes. It doesn't necessarily mean that the output per household is much more than in other parts of the country. Uh, but again, they do have uh, larger farm sizes in this part of the country. Um, the maize farmers that we, we sort of uh, examined um, for these maize farmers, in large part, um, they will typically do intercropping with um, groundnuts or peanuts. Uh, generally, they were using significantly uh, lower levels of uh, inputs compared to what the recommended uh, levels were. Um, the average was about seven CDs compared to the 60 or so CDs that um, the uh, Ministry of Food and Agriculture uh, recommended um, at the time. Uh, yields were significantly low. Uh, again, for uh, maize for that part of the country, um, 
with the right inputs, um, the maize was expected to provide between one ton and 1.5 tons per acre. Um, but these farmers were doing just about uh, 200 kilograms per acre. Okay. So now we give some farmers, um, like I said from earlier on, we had three arms of the experiment. One was just looking at easing the insurance or the risky um, constraints. The other, the second was just tackling the credit constraints. And the third was doing a combination of both credit and indeed insurance. And so we collected this data over um, two uh, periods, and then we estimated whether uh, compared to the control farmers, whether either one of the treatment arms um, exhibited significant changes in respect of different outcome variables. So the harvest value, the chemical values, um, the uh, total costs uh, as well. Uh, remember again, it's, uh, and let me make this point, we were giving these farmers the credits so that with the aim that it will help ease uh, the constraint associated with agricultural production. Now what's, if you just take the harvest values, what you do find is that um, the chemicals used um, increases and the total costs uh, also increases for these farmers. Um, when you take both the, no, so let's take the other one, which is the capital drops. Um, if you just relax the capital constraints, you realize that it does not change any of these key outcome variables. However, when you do a combination of both the acres as well as the, sorry, the insurance as well as the uh, capital um, drop, you do find that um, you see some action in respect of the harvest value and then the total costs. Okay. Um, the cultivated plots as well, um, we see again some action for the insurance um, constraints and also where we actually relax both the insurance and capital constraints. Again, um, for the sum of high wages with respect to um, high labor on the farms, again, for the case where we have both of the constraints being relaxed, you do find that um, farmers responded positively in terms of investments in agricultural production. Now, when we do the labor days, and um, again, so uh, let, let me just also uh, reflect a bit more on this. Um, so of course we didn't ex ante expect any results one way or the other, the results in one way or the other. However, we also knew from our engagement with farmers that um, credit will typically come up as number one when you talk to farmers in respect of why they do not invest as much in agriculture. Of course, and like I alluded to, 
if you probe, you also get the issues associated with um, the risky aspects of um, agriculture production. And so once we started looking at the outcomes, um, the major outcomes, and we were not seeing for the capital drops, um, clearly um, we, we were concerned in a way. And so we kept asking, where then did the money go? Okay, so we tried to look for um, the effects in respect to farmers for as many variables as we possibly could. And crop sales seem to have increased. And again, what it might suggest is that farmers may have been investing more maybe in storage or in the marketing of um, the crops or they could then um, with the um, increased cash they were in a position not to sell during the bumper um, harvest period when prices typically tend to be very low and therefore um, the sales then also respond accordingly. Now, in terms of the, some of the other household welfare variables, um, food security improves. There is um, a bit of uh, evidence there um, because this is missed meals um, and that is associated with both um, capital drop and then insurance. And also you do find that in um, the case of the um, combined um, constraints, relaxing the combined constraints, you find in that utility expenses also seem to go up. So we also wanted to understand um, what the demand for insurance is. And as I mentioned, the actually fair price was um, about uh, 9.5 Ghana cities. And because we randomized the prices of the insurance products to the farmers, we're able to um, essentially tell what the nature of the demand for the insurance products. And we do find that even if it was a bit low, um, there was some evidence that the demand was, um, it, the, the shape of the demand curve for insurance was in the right uh, direction. Um, however, um, the actually fair uh, price, or the actually fair price, the insurance take up was just about 40%. Uh, that was for the uh, 2010 uh, season. That was a year after the first insurance had been done. So uh, uh, to summarize, um, what the study sought to do was to ask how um, uninsured risks and also credit constraints influences agriculture investments of smallholder farmers. Again, it's important to mention this is of smallholder farmers. Um, we uh, note that uh, investments generally otherwise among these farmers are very low. And um, we, the results seem to point to the fact that credit may be a constraint, but not a binding constraint. Uh, however, insurance um, seem to be more likely a binding constraint or more of a constraint relative to um, credit. But again, like I said, um, the 
demand for insurance is generally uh, shaped correctly. And we do find that um, the, of course, lower price of insurance will mean um, quite high uptake. The challenge, of course, with any insurance product is that the actually fair price is also driven by the cost of actually uh, delivering the insurance products and also uh, the risk associated with the markets and of course the number potential number of insurers that you will get and um, that probably remains still uh, problematic in terms of the actual fair price and therefore the demand for insurance um, among these smallholder farmers. So um, I think I will stop here and then um, maybe we can have a more general conversation around this issue. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Robert. It was great to hear directly from the author about this landmark study. Um, I think if it's okay with you, I'll moderate the discussion a little bit because I can see both the people in the room here in Stockholm and the remote students online. Um, so if anybody has questions, now is your time. Yes. Yeah, if uh, the risk uh, constraint, if that is driven by insurance and demand for insurance, isn't that a liquidity constraint in itself as well? Because maybe these farms don't have money to pay for insurance. So isn't there a liquidity constraint behind the risk constraint? Mm -hmm. Was that audible, Robert? Not, not very, no. Uh, let, me, let me repeat it. The question is, um, doesn't the insurance constraint imply a risk constraint? Like maybe people aren't buying the insurance because they're liquidity constrained. And so there's actually a, a, a capital constraint behind the insurance itself. So, yes, I mean, I, I think that, that that is true. Um, but that will be um, that will be essentially suggesting that your theory of change then will be working through the capital constraints, insurance, and then the production, right? The investments in agriculture production. So yes, of course, um, that in itself could influence the um, could influence the um, level of insurance that is demanded by these poor, uh, relatively poor households. However, it still will not explain the relative um, the relative difference between what the insurance. Um, households with insurance do in terms of investments as against households with the capital. Of course, um, the, we didn't necessarily, um, of course, okay, so we, we probably marketed our insurance to the um, set of households so that we could we, we, we didn't want contamination, but that didn't necessarily mean that the households couldn't also purchase uh, within the communities that the insurance was actually being done. Remember that the insurance product, um, particularly in respect of the, um, let's say the third arm, which does the, the looking at both constraints, it was both for capital and then for insurance. And even for that, you do not get, depending on the price of the insurance, you do not get 100% take up. Um, and so, yes, of course, that capital could constrain the insurance um, demand, but it still does not explain 
why capital is not a binding constraint for agricultural investment. At least that's my, my thinking. Yep. yep. Um, Pedro, I think you were next. Yeah, thank you, Johannes. Thank you, Professor Hobbit, for the opportunity to discuss your paper. I was thinking about uh, the impact on the profits, on the farmer profits, because we saw on the paper that the, the value of harvest was, that there was impact, a big impact on the value of harvest, but the total cost increased too. Uh, uh, I would like to, to hear from you about this. And uh, a question about the more concern about the implementation of uh, policy of this kind, uh, provide insurance for these farmers was profitable. Do, in the research, do you have some estimate about the pro profit made based on the provision of insurance for these farmers? Thank you. Sorry, so let me try and then get the second part of the question. So you are asking um, the profits made on the insurance. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So <laughs> that's a very interesting question. And uh, it, 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 so because um, this was almost a pure experiment. It was a kind of a pilot with the aim that once we could actually find evidence of one existing demand for the product among these poor holder farmers, then two, we could engage more with the insurance, potential insurance and the national insurance company to try and then design a product for poor households. So this was the insurance itself was just uh, um, resources from the experiment or from the, from the research. And so generally um, there wasn't much of, um, uh, I, I, it was actually a loss because in, in, indeed, in the first year after the experiment started, there was, and if you saw the last picture that I showed where there was this guy carrying something on his head, um, it's not just a random picture. It's a picture of one of the agents going to a farming community after it had rained. And this was the level of water that he had to go through. So clearly there was an issue with payouts. In a way that may have influenced also some of the demand that we saw with the insurance because we did pay out significantly because of heavy rains after the first year of the experiment. So generally I wouldn't say that we had any, <laughs> there was any uh, profits per se for the insurance uh, product per se. And indeed, it, just, it remains the bay um, because even to this day, we still have not been able to, there are some gradual uh, movements in the area in respect of the insurance uh, for uh, rainfall insurance, but it still hasn't really taken off um, as much as we would have liked to see. And indeed, um, following all the excitement that we, we had with the results that we found. Um, on the question of the, the profits, the farmer profits, it's, it's, it's a bother. But also I think that it's something that for those of us who are interested in um, agriculture economics or the economics of agriculture households, let me put it that way, because I'm not an agriculture economist. Um, it's rather the economics of agriculture households. It, it's something that we continue to contemplate in relation to the costs associated with agriculture production, particularly for smallholder farmers. Now, if and every time you bring in 
the labor inputs. And of course, you know that the pricing of agricultural labor is always problematic and it remains to this day. Okay, do you use the shadow price? Um, do you use some average price within the community, et cetera, et cetera? And how do you then accommodate? Because many of these farmers use a lot of um, family labor. Okay, so how do you accommodate and appropriately incorporate um, these labor costs? But once you build in the labor cost, you find that the cost balloons quite um, significantly, and that is always um, the source of the um, negative profits that um, seems to be associated with uh, agricultural production for smallholder farmers. Of course, the other side has to do with the kind of bumps that one expects to see in respect of the yields, which we are still not seeing. So we are still around what um, 1.2 hectares per, sorry, 1.2 tons per hectare, right? Which is about 1,200 kilograms per, uh, the hectare is what is about 2.7 something of the um, acre, right? So it's still not happening on the yield front. Um, I'm sure that if we could actually get the yield front to bump up significantly, then in spite of the increases in cost, um, we are likely to begin to see um, some sort of uh, positive numbers associated with the profits. So, but I think that the cost there is driven largely by the labor costs. Right, thank you. Um, I think, uh, is there a question in the room? Yes, one. then there's um, more likely to have more um, investment and that's good I guess because that's what you want but then the problem first was that they don't have insurance because they don't have money to get their insurance at the first place so do you have any suggestions or could you just repeat them like what to do about this because in your experiment you gave them free insurance so that's why it worked I guess but if they have to pay it in like a normal way how will that be? Was that audible, Robert? No, not very. Um, okay. So, so the question is, the experiment shows that insurance is very useful, uh, but the experiment provided the insurance for free. So what's a way that uh, people can get the insurance in a world where that isn't possible anymore? Is that a fair summary of the question? Yeah, I mean, that that's certainly... Uh, it's certainly... Uh, it's a very good question. Um, it still remains um, interesting how we deal with it. I mean, there have been suggestions of using um, the um, the stocks, uh, grain stocks, etc., to procure the insurance product. Um, that has its own challenges, and it's not um, that easy to, from an implementation uh, point. I think that um, we one has to start from somewhere, and we still are doing um, significant um, subsidies in the agricultural sector generally. I think that from a very holistic point, um, my, my own um, view is that we, what this result is showing, of course, that it was an experiment relating to um, grants and then insurance, but what it is showing is that we need to think about dealing with the smallholder culture constraints in a holistic manner. Relating it to the question that uh, one of the colleagues asked earlier um, is whether indeed the credit constraint in itself limits insurance. 
okay? And this question is along those lines. However, if you actually relax both the credit constraint and the insurance constraint, then you, you do get the impact that um, one would expect, okay? So it is about thinking of the support to smallholder farmers in a holistic way um, as a kind of uh, a, a start. And of course, um, you can also relate this to, for instance, the livelihoods approach that is being pushed recently. And that also relates to um, poor households who are largely um, agriculture households. So for instance, if you are giving cash grants to some of these poor households, if there is an insurance product that is available, that is easy to understand, and that is affordable for these households, does that provide more of a platform for actually uh, getting sustainable uh, results in terms of moving households out of poverty. I think that for me is the way I will look at it. Mm -hmm. Daniela, you had a question? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Professor Sagan, for your time. So my question is um, goes off a bit uh, from your research and is with the increase of climate, climate disasters, I would expect rainfall to be more recurrent. And I was wondering how do you think that would impact the risk aversion uh, to investing in new technologies in these uh, fertilizers, if this would increase um, that that uh, skepticism to do to do so, or in the other way, um, increase the demand for that type of insurance. And as a second point, I was curious to, to know. Well, I I, I don't know uh, what is the main uh, driver of these farmers if it's uh, self-sustainance that they that's the reason mainly why they, they do these crops or um, they also aim to seek um, to, to put in the market if, and if there's a market a, a high demand for it um, yeah that'll be it thank you okay thank you very much um, so let, let me try and get so one uh, question related to climate change and of course the rainfall patterns changing and what that implies for the rainfall, uh, the insurance product, right? The demand for the insurance product. Um, but, and the second question relates to the motivation of the farmers uh, generally in terms of whether they want to continue to do sustenance or subsistence farming or to actually uh, put these things on the uh, market. It, it, so if, if those are the two questions, that's fine. Um, so on the first question, I think that clearly um, one of the, the challenges that is associated with most insurance products, and th this is even the case for more sophisticated insurance products, it has to do with asymmetry inf information, right? Um, now, yes, of course, um, if the rainfall patterns are changing, I expect that the parameters associated with the insurance product should be changing as well. So that, that, that's the first point I want to make. The second point is that uh, increasingly we are more um, sophisticated uh, ways of providing um, weather information to farmers. And in my mind, um, increasingly, this then will become uh, more relevant um, with the cost of the satellite imageries also coming down significantly over the years. Um, the basis risk that is associated with even the rainfall insurance is also going to be improving over time. And um, in some of the um, sort of uh, 
exercises that I have seen, some of the satellite imagery can actually um, be quite um, quote unquote micro um, in, in that sense, and then be able to hone in on uh, specific farmers plots. And therefore one is able to better predict what actually is happening, what will happen to a farmer's farm, but also what has actually happened. So the actuals and the predicted, I think we are getting better at uh, providing that kind of information. Also now you find that you have a lot of um, cost-effective ways of actually transmitting this information to farmers so that we actually improve the um, challenges associated with the information asymmetry. So whilst the, um, the climate is driving changes in rainfall patterns, et cetera, I think that these insurance products should also be dynamic and should change as and when um, the conditions or the parameters that drive um, the insurance products um, are changing. And of course, now with um, increasing use of social media and indeed uh, ICT platforms, farmers are increasingly also becoming more aware and coming into contact with more information, which will help improve uh, generally the insurance market. The, the second question on the focus on the, the, the farmers or the motivation of the farmers. I think for every farmer, of course, um, they would want to uh, produce. Um, I haven't interacted with a farmer who would say that uh, they produce only because they want to feed uh, themselves and their, their families. I think for many farmers, they produce with the aim of uh, getting it to the markets. Ultimately, like with any other productive activity, you are producing because you want to improve the welfare of the family, right? Now, if you can improve the welfare by only the food that you produce, I'm sure farmers and like everyone else will do that, will keep the food, However, they need other things. However, the cost associated with even the storage is a problem. Now, for farmers where they produce and cannot store it, if there is a ready market, they would definitely sell. The challenge sometimes is that the agricultural production is rain fed is driven by rainfall, they produce within a specified window and everybody is producing within that specified window. And so they get their outputs almost at the same time. And so you find that if you are to plot the output per month, you'll find that in certain months, you will have everybody experiencing um, an increase in output and that then results in a decline in the prices. And so where you do not have storage facilities for these farmers, even though ultimately they would have loved to sell it, they also do appreciate that they borrowed money to, to produce the uh, agriculture products and therefore would definitely would have loved to sell it, but if the price that they are going to be getting is just does not make sense, what they then do is to sell just a little bit, see what they, they use that money for, whether it's to pay school fees, etc., etc., and then wait till when they need a bit more money again, and then they, um, they try and then sell. So it's a multiplicity of factors which then makes the behavior, exposed behavior of the farmers seem as if they are, pro they are typically producers, uh, subsistence producers. But I believe that if the right infrastructure in terms of storage, in terms of 
the marketing where available, um, they would definitely would love to sell. I, I always say, and sorry, I, I keep to I keep going on and on. Let me just add this. I keep saying that a maize farmer, a typical maize farmer is not different from a cocoa farmer, right? But cocoa farmers can borrow sometimes at interest rates of up to 80%, 100%, invest in their cocoa farm because they are guaranteed a price and they are guaranteed markets. The only reason the maize farmer will not attempt to borrow unless it's really, really there is that they are not guaranteed a price. They are not guaranteed a market. Thank you. Great, thank, thank you. you very Thank you very much, Robert. So uh, we're already at the end of our hour. That passed very quickly. Uh, oh. So we want to thank you so much for making time for us, especially at such an early hour. It's really great to hear about this great paper directly from one of the authors. So thank you so much for, for joining us. Big round of applause for Professor Arasa. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks for inviting me. Yeah, thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. OK, great. Um, so just a few um, housekeeping items at the end. Uh, so next Monday, there's another Stata Lab. Uh, both the Stockholm students and the remote students are invited. It's from 3 to 5 p.m. Stockholm time on Zoom, and I'll send a link uh, the day before. Um, next week in lecture, we'll talk about another possible source of poverty traps, and that's nutrition, topic that's uh, dear to my heart. And that lecture will be on Thursday, the 23rd. And note that the time is different. It's at 10 a.m. Yay, uh, in this uh, auditorium. And so sorry to the remote exchange students, for some of you that's at even crazier times of the morning, those of you who are in Central and Middle and the South America, but um, hope to see you then. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.